Okay, I think let's get started then. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for a very special Zoom edition of ODI Fridays. Uh, my name is James and I'm a consultant at the Open Data Institute. And today we're joined by Giselle Corey, who is going to be presenting today's lunchtime lecture. Uh, Giselle is the Executive Director of Datakind UK, a charity that provides free data science support to increase the impact of the social sector. And today, Giselle will be presenting the case for data science as a powerful tool for good by sharing some of the lessons that they've learned at Datakind through their efforts. Before handing over to Giselle, can I please ask that all participants turn their microphones and cameras off during the presentation? You will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end. And if you do want to ask something, please submit your question using the chat function. And after the presentation, I'll ask people one by one to unmute and ask their questions. I'd also like to remind you that we are recording this session. Once again, thank you for joining us today. And now I'll hand over to Giselle. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Giselle, I'm the Executive Director of Datakind UK. Uh, I'm going to be talking today for 20 minutes or so, and then uh, hopefully we can move into a, a great discussion with all your questions. Um, so you can, you can see my screen. I'm going to run through a few slides. I'll occasionally break to, to show you a few other things. Um, but for now, um, this is the, the, the four main points we're going to go through. So who's who? Firstly, who, who are we and who are you? Because I'd love to know who I'm speaking to in this wonderful virtual room. Um, what's data science? That'll just be my, my quick minute to make sure that when I say data science, um, you hear the same thing as I mean. Uh, how can it be applied to social change organisations? That's going to be the bulk of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and finally, just some tips for, for getting started um, if you are an organisation wanting to use some of uh, these uh, approaches and tools. Uh, so, who are we? Uh, we're a charity that builds data science capacity in social change organisations. What's a social change organisation? That's our umbrella term for social enterprises, charities, public sector bodies. So, any organisation that's essentially acting for, for social uh, good before profit. We do loads of different programmes with uh, organisations. I'll go through them quickly in a moment so you kind of get an idea of, of where I'm coming from when I, I talk about our experience working with social change organisations. Um, they um, are pretty much all uh, free with the exception of some of our really in-depth projects where we uh, usually get uh, co-funding um, with a, a, a grant maker or trust foundation. Um, mostly we are uh, incredibly lucky to have a uh, community of data scientists and it's that community of, of data scientists who give their time uh, for free so as volunteers um, to staff our projects um, and give their expertise so who, who, who we work with here's, here's a bit of a, a selection of some logos to throw at you and um, just to give an idea of some of the organizations we've worked with you can see here a, a, a lot of charities mainly some national some regional uh, a commonality tends to be that they're service delivery charities um, rather than say um, kind of campaigning or um, uh, a kind of uh, perhaps advice giving um, but organizations who, who actually engage with individuals and, and want to understand better who those individuals are they're engaging with and how uh, and how they're doing how they're performing as an organization I mentioned that we're volunteer run just to give you an idea this is some of our happy faces um, so when we run some of our uh, our big events we'll we'll make sure to take a few pictures normally they're ones more like in the uh along the bottom of the picture or on the left hand side in person of course uh, times have changed so we're now running all our events virtually so the big image on the on the top right that's a, a screenshot from our dive that happened this weekend just gone by and uh, we had um around 40 data scientists uh, working across two charity projects, so the Brilliant Club, um, who try and uh, increase access to university, and Citizens Advice Manchester, uh, one of the largest Citizens Advice bureaus uh, across the country. 
so it can it can be done all these all these virtual events um and it was it was actually a lot of fun um, and talk to us separately if that's is something you're you're grappling with at the moment and want a bit of advice on um so i said i'd talk in a bit more detail about what we do um so here i'm going to go through just very quickly our main programs um on the light touch side we have what we call data therapy it's our drop-in for anyone from a social change organization who wants some advice on maybe a technical problem something quite kind of operational you know i was doing this in excel and i can't figure out how to make it work it's broke um or maybe something very high level and strategic and like i've just done a digital strategy it doesn't include the word data is that a problem um and all the all the issues in between uh we uh, were pre pre corona running that in london in edinburgh and online we're now uh, solely running that uh, online um so uh, available to to you if you represent one of those social change organizations we've been talking about um our second type of support data dives um, these are probably what we're best known for from the outside they look like a hackathon um they're actually uh usually about three to six month projects um but they do culminate they're punctuated by these two-day hackathon style events that bring together data scientists and social change organizations to work on specific challenges that have been presented by those organizations it, the the reason the projects are so long is we work in advance of those events to scope out projects prepare data etc with those organizations so that they are tackling the uh, challenges that are most uh, prescient for them uh, they're also usually a lot of fun uh, so i'd recommend them if you're more on the on the kind of technical side uh, our longer term events, uh, sorry, projects, these are we call data cores. So you, you'll see there's a trend here of a lot of data kind jargon coming in. Uh, these data cores are, are for deployment. So whereas with the data dive, we would be exploring with a charity the, the potential power of data and data science and seeing what, uh, what it might be useful uh, for in the context of that organisation. A data core is more focused on deployment. So that means that we'd be wanting to take a particular function or tool or model and make it part of that organization's normal business as usual. And then our social data society. So this is a bit of a shout out to you if you are or know of uh, technical or data -y people who work in social change organizations. This is our peer network for them. Um, it was created in response to requests from social sector data scientists who um, wanted to, to kind of have a community of data literate social sector colleagues where they could share challenges and provide support. Um, so that runs regularly. Um, also very fun, I can vouch for that. Uh, and then lastly, th this isn't a program, this is, uh, is a bit of a misfit. It, it, this is a thread that runs through everything we do, the kind of responsible data use, but I did want to bring it up here because it's such a core thread of what we do. Um, so whether it's a specific project like the one that's just shown here on this graphic, it's in some uh, guidance we created for the Association of Medical Research Charities on using data in digital services on behalf of their members, um, or whether it's simply uh, ensuring that organizations are starting out on the right foot when they do do a data science uh, project that ethos of responsible data use is um, a, a big focus of what we do so that's a bit about us i'd now love to know about you uh, i put uh, in in the holding slide for anyone who's here a bit before we started a, a menti code if you haven't uh, used menti.com before it's very simple so so go to menti.com stick in that code you can see on the top right of the, the slide um, and there's two questions there to answer so if you um if you haven't done that please do um, and i am going to flick from these slides to uh hopefully the the results of that menti that are coming in um Wonderful, a big, a, a, a big distribution across all sectors, fabulous. Um, so across charity, public, private, and then other. I'm uh, keen to know what that, those others are. If you, if you ask questions at the end, please tell me what your other is. Um, okay, so I will, I'll try and keep that in mind um, as, I, uh, as I go that we've, we've got, that, um, got, got that skew. If things do, if you do think, oh, I wonder how that would be applicable to my situation, and I haven't answered that during the presentation, then please do ask at the end. Um, our second question, what's your confidence level for data use? Okay, so definitely a skew here to, to the kind of the good uh, and a few supers as well. Um, okay, that's, that's, ex that's, um, that, that's excellent. 
and some, some more results coming in. Okay, thank you. That really helps uh, me most definitely and, and hopefully is also helpful for, for you as well. You know who your, your virtual uh, co-audience members are a little bit better now. Uh, so, I said I'd, I'd uh, do a little who's who. Um, that's done now. Let's talk very quickly about what's data science. Um, given the, the, the spread of those skills, um, def definitely not going to take too long on this, but I, I do want to just touch on it because I'll keep using this term uh, and, uh, and I want to make sure I'm um, using it in a way that's kind of commonly understood among our group today. So, what is data science? Um, I'm going to show you a, a, a quick chart. If you don't like, uh, diagrams, don't worry about it. I would ever, throughout this presentation, whenever I show a diagram, I will also talk through it. Um, but if, if you do like uh, a cheeky little Venn diagram, then this, this is for you. Um, so th this represents one kind of uh, articulation of data science. Everyone has their own, by the way. Um, it's the intersection of, of expertise, of, of hacking skills, and then of more traditional maths and science knowledge. Uh, so, sorry, maths and statistics knowledge. So you might want to um, kind of combine essentially that the the more traditional and the newer is hacking skills. Um, that that's wonderful when those are combined. But when they're combined without this substantive expertise bit at the bottom, um, you you get great great kind of techniques and great things produced, um, but not necessarily kind of the impact on the social sector that we'd like to see. Uh, which is why when we put teams together, we want to make sure we've We've got all these all these things covered, so we're making sure we've got the, the newer skills and more traditional skills, but also uh, kind of an expertise in the subject matter that we are looking at, which is why we work with um, these uh, the, the social social change organisations rather than deciding we know the answer and doing all this stuff ourselves. Um, just an, another quick articulation of, of what data science um, is. It, it's it's used quite broadly, and I think that's that's because it. it it's essentially this the process of using tools to kind of gain insight and knowledge from data and that's that's something we've done always it's just that our tools these days are kind of quite nifty um so data science is is the kind of term we uh, apply to kind of the 21st century version of something we've been doing um all of you know, forever in terms of human civilization kind of looking at the the data around us um, and and drawing conclusions from that um so uh, if, if this is something that's new to you please don't be um kind of scared off by that uh, or confused by it essentially uh, swap it out in your mind uh, with whatever permutation of, of the, the kind of explanations i just gave fits you best um and uh, uh yeah so uh, i'm going to talk a little bit about how this data science stuff uh, can be applied to social change organizations um i'm much prefer talking in specifics than in the abstract. So how I'm going to go through this section is with specific case studies of organizations we've worked with, um, all of which I'll, I'll kind of present a few minutes on, uh, telling you kind of a bit about the organization, a bit about their challenge that they're, and their hunch and their hypothesis, which is something we, we often try and bring in with data science. We start with kind of a guess and then see if we can disprove or prove that guess. Um, and, uh, and I'll talk to you a, a little bit about the technique they used as well. Um, the last example I have of these is a video. And so it would be a nice little kind of just uh, a, a nice little pause for us as we hear from, from an organization itself uh, for three or four minutes about the problems they face and the, the resolutions to them. Uh, so one um, bit of structure before I go through all these examples, I'll, I'll be talking under these kind of four, um, four, four categories. And, I, and I'd say, we're, in our experience for the last seven or so years of working with social change organizations everything pretty much fits in these buckets um there might be some that fit in more than one and um, that's pretty common but it's uh it's been a challenge to find any that don't fit inside these um again please please do tell me in questions if you think oh no shouldn't there be a fifth kind of category um uh, are these just looking through these with any, any explanation i think um I think maybe a little bit, I'll just I'll go through each of them quickly. So understanding need and demand. So for example, this could be where, where are the areas with the highest rates of vulnerable people, with the highest rates of rust sleeping, with the highest rates of young families, uh, whatever it may be. That that could be understanding and need, for example. Um, and then demand might very nicely overlap with need, or it might be actually, you know, who 
who is wanting our services, who is trying to kind of get through the front door and where are those individuals. Uh, understanding clients, please replace this word client with beneficiary or user uh, or supporter, whatever um, uh, language you prefer. Um, this might be, for example, what proportion of my clients are non-native English speakers. Um, our third section, evaluating services. So very broad. So essentially, does, uh, does our service work? So just program X lead to an improvement in school performance, for example. And then you can get much very detailed within that. Uh, and then lastly, improving operational efficiency. So uh, can prediction be used to improve or augment human decision making as a, as a typical example in the data science world of that. So on, on our first bucket there, so understanding need and demand. And in the example I'll, I'll give here is a bit about understanding um, what you perceive to be need and trying to understand if that is an accurate representation of need. So this example is from, from Streetlink. Um, it's, it's an app made by the charity Homeless Think. Um, it allows the public to send an alert if they notice someone who looks like they are rough sleeping. And then this triggers a uh, homeless link and its partner organization sending out a support worker or outreach worker to that person for support. Um, the, a little note here, by the way, the, the, all the examples I use here are ones where the organizations have, have given a thumbs up for us to share their findings. Um, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, but it's it's not uh, a default for how we work. So I think one other thing to say about data science is that sometimes you can find things that you didn't want to find, uh, which is why when we work partner organisations, we the, the data remains theirs, the findings remain theirs. We we don't share anything unless they say yes, sure, please please do share this, because um, it, it, it's hard. Data science is kind of it's asking questions without knowing the answers, and that that can be tricky for loads of reasons for organisations. Um, but that so that is a, a little kind of a little. Uh, uh, point I wanted to make about the the kind of uh, the way the way we work but also the nature of data science so moving on from that this this example so what does this chart show over time which is on the bottom axis it shows the number uh, of alerts coming in to Streetlink what they wanted to uh, so that is the the blue line what they wanted to know was whether the number of alerts they received represented the number of rough sleepers this is a wonderful thing to be asked as a data scientist uh, because you immediately try to create a line which looks like the, the real data, which looks like that number of alerts, the blue line, um, but doesn't uh, take data from it. So it's, it's not the number of alerts, it's, it's other things that we're using to try and model. Um, in this case, uh, they didn't actually have to work too hard to do that. The data scientist could model that blue line, the, the number of alerts, with only two things. So with the weather and with street links twitter activity so what does this tell us it tells us great fun for a data science project but actually for, for street link a big insight because alerts don't represent the amount of rough sleeping so uh, the, the alerts they're getting aren't mapping demand uh, or need the uh, alerts are in fact mapping more about us the the people who are likely to be um giving these alerts um, what we've seen on Twitter and where the street link have, have tweeted recently and also the, the temperature and our kind of desire to respond uh, to, the, to the need we see around us. Um, a, quick, uh, a quick second example here of, of understanding need and demand. Um, and I did say that things can fall kind of into multiple buckets and this one that, that, that definitely falls into the need and demand bucket as well as the understanding your, your beneficiaries bucket. So Butter UK are an organisation that provides support to uh, families, um, so in particular parents of um, children and young people as well as some young people themselves. Uh, one of the ways they do that is to get in um, calls and messages with requests for particular bits of advice and guidance. They then tag these. Um, so they had this, this, this data set and they said, look, we have a hunch that when you call about something, the next time you call, maybe you're more likely to call about topic X because the first time you called, you called about topic Y. Is there a link between what people come back with given what they came to us with the first time? Um, so it's very messy. Again, don't worry if you don't like look at this graph. It's, it's, a, it's messy looking, um, but some quite beautiful insights. So they found that if you started with child health, so the first time you called, for example, as a parent about your child's health, you were likely to call back with a set of issues. Um, so you're likely to call back firstly about your own mental health um, and either later or um, on, the, on the, the next call about domestic abuse in your household. 
So what this um, tells us, um, firstly, is that there are there are patterns there. So Buttle could respond, but with some early intervention there to try and um, tackle issues before they become uh, particularly problematic. Um, but it, it also gives you an understanding of kind of clusters. So how people are affected by multiple things, and then how your your support can uh, respond accordingly to to multiple challenges and difficulties in people's lives. Uh, so some quick, uh, I should probably speed up. I'm, uh, I'm taking my time with these ones. I'm going to um, give, uh, yeah, a, a quick example. So Mind Mental Health uh, Charity, this is their um, London branch, the City and the Orphan Forest branch. They had a question around attendance. They had a hunch, again, always starts with a hunch, um, that attendance uh, of group therapy, so that's therapy that people come back multiple times, um, and that that the, that support is offered in, in groups of individuals. That the attendance over time was related to the diversity of the group. And what this finding tells us uh, is that the hunch was totally right. So uh, attendance by the end of a set period of time over which the um, the intervention, the support was being given, is what you can see on the on the um, left hand side on the axis going zero to eighty percent. Uh, and on the bottom, you can see diversity of three types, so gender diversity, age diversity, and ethnic groups. So taking the middle one, you can see number of age bands. If there's one age band, it means everyone in the group is of the same age band. If there's six age bands, you've got a very age diverse group. What you can also see there is, diverse, is attendance is lowest for those very age diverse groups. And you can see a similar trend with gender and with ethnic diversity. So something for, for mine to go away and think about was, do they, you know, how do they or do they at all change the nature of their group makeup to support higher attendance um, going forward? Uh, and my, my final example before I'm going to break to our, our short video is uh, for my. So this is a, a Welsh charity that supported um, uh, vulnerable young people. So hoping to, to reduce youth homelessness, ideally hoping to, to kind of intervene before things got um, particularly bad they wanted to understand their um uh, service uh, outcomes so this is a kind of evaluating your services bucket um and they decided they'd, they'd combine that evaluation uh with what we call segmentation so instead of looking just at is our service any good they want to understand is our service any good for particular groups within it the groups they looked at as you can see on the various um axes and boxes of this chart are whether someone was a youth offender whether they were a care leaver and what their gender was and here you can and, and then sorry one other thing to explain you can see on the right hand side that the key tells you that um excellent uh, outcomes are given in green uh, exceeds expectation uh, but not quite excellent are given in gray and then pink meets expectation um, so you're, you're wanting to get to a state where everyone's got these wonderful uh, green excellent outcomes uh, but what they found by this analysis was that if you're not a youth offender or a care leaver and you're female so these people on the far left side of this chart you are likely to have excellent outcomes three out of four times um, but if you are a youth offender and you are a care leaver and also you're male you're going to have excellent outcomes more like a third of uh, in a third of, of instances um, perhaps not surprising to those who kind of have experience working with these different groups um but for what this did tell uh Clamai and why it was insightful for them is that they hadn't been aware that there was this disparity in their the outcomes uh, that people were achieving through their services so a big um uh kind of uh, a big bit of insight for them to take away and see see what that what those findings might lead to in terms of service design and um uh, supporting supporting those individuals that they do that you know that they very much do want to help so for example men who are youth offenders and care leavers yeah how can they do that better uh an interesting a side note on this it doesn't tell you why and that's often you find with data science it tells you something and doesn't tell you a bunch of other things it leaves many questions and i think that in a way is kind of a, a, a good outcome of, or a mark of good data science um, that you don't try and understand everything in one go but actually you, you kind of incrementally learn more and more and your questions get better and more targeted given that, that uh, what you've just learned or the insight you've just come across. Um, finally this is a, a, a operational efficiency one from, from that bucket. Um, 
this i'm not going to tell you about this chart i'm going to be cheeky instead and let it the, this project speak for itself and um, this is, is a project by the welcome center and this is the video i mentioned so i'm going to quickly um flick over to a, i think it's a three or four minute video uh, i'm not going to explain much um because I, I think it's all explained uh, within the video itself i'll then come back and um and talk about a few of the um tips uh, and tricks that we've learned from working with um, social change organisations over the years. Uh, here we go. So Welcome Centre is a large independent food bank. Uh, we serve Huddersfield, which is in West Yorkshire and the, the surrounding area. Um, and we provide people in crisis with practical support, so food, toiletries, bedding, and we also provide an advocacy guidance and support service to help people move past their crisis. So we've noticed a trend over the last five years or so towards people needing longer term support. Obviously no one wants to visit a food bank. We don't want people to be dependent on our service. We're a crisis service. So we wanted to make an early intervention for those people. So our trustee, Andrew, has a computer technology type background. Um, he'd built us a bespoke referral database. We'd started recording information about the clients who were being referred to us and the number of times they were being referred. That allowed us to get a picture of our demand here at the Welcome Centre. And to add value to that information, we got involved with DataKind in an activity called a Data Dive in 2016. DataKind UK has a wide community of data scientists across the country and what we try and do is get their skills and actually apply that to support social change organisations to make the best use of the data that they have. The Welcome Centre initially came to us recognising that they've collected a lot of data and they had a specific issue about how can they use their data um, much more effectively to enable them to provide better services for their service users. They looked at our data and helped us to formulate a model to classify clients as being either low use, medium use or high use in terms of their relationship with the Welcome Centre. So this is our client database. So we can see here the clients that we've referred to today, the clients that have been referred in the last week and overall all the clients that were currently active. And so green is low use, yellow and orange are medium use and the red are the high use clients. And then that, and following that, both DataKind and ourselves felt there was more we could do in terms of coming up with a, a technology solution to identify from the first referral, if possible, whether someone's likely to come to us once, three times or 50 times, so that the people who are at risk of becoming dependent on us, we can catch them on the second visit, have a cup of tea, have a chat about what's going on and try and steer them on a different path if we can. Through a grant provided by Esme Fairburn, we were able then to um, develop a longer term project where we found four fantastic data scientists to help them build a model and to identify who should we um, actually provide our early intervention uh, work towards. So what you can see here, the client referral history, the score represents how intensively they've used our service over the last 12 months. What the model does is it tries to predict what the likely score is going to be in the next 12 month period. It's this information here that our advice guidance and support worker then uses to determine how they're going to interact with that client. So I think what the benefits that the work with DataKind gave us was that first of all they gave us confidence that we were doing uh, sensible things with our data. They kind of validated the methods that we'd already chosen ourselves. They extended those methods into new areas where we didn't have uh, capability. And uh, as a result of that, we've benefited in terms of improving our business processes. Without doing that, we, we wouldn't be able to help clients in the way we do. We would be handing out a food pack and, and, and not much more. I think it's really easy to be scared of data and be scared of GDPR and be scared of all of these things. But actually, if, if you can embrace the idea and move forwards with it, it can be a really positive thing for you as an organisation and for the people that you're working with. A 
Okay, thank you um, for uh, staying with us through that. It, I hope that is a, a, a helpful kind of indication of, of what it's actually like for a, for a charity. I think particularly from kind of a te technical perspective, I'm a, a data scientist myself, you can kind of think of all of this in terms of like quite flashy stuff, quite exciting stuff and uh, how AI is going to change the charity sector, et cetera. Um, but actually that, um, in, in the words of the, uh, the people at the Welcome Centre, is um, a much more true to life, um, uh, much more kind of uh, frequent example of the kind of things that can be useful. Um, and it's, it's about kind of overcoming uh, fear of, of, uh, of the law in the form of GDPR, uh, fear of uh, data use hurting rather than helping the people you seek to serve, um, fear of it just being kind of confusing and, and not appropriate for staff, um, fear of your, your service provision changing in ways you don't like. And that kind of overcoming those concerns and, and seeing if it's right for you is uh, uh, luckily something that I think the Welcome Centre did very much to their, the, the benefit of the people they seek to serve um, and something that we, uh, we haven't, uh, we don't see as a, a super common outcome in a lot of um, charitable organisations. I think we are still, um, broadly speaking, for, particularly for a lot of smaller organisations at the beginning of this, this journey. Uh, so, uh, I told you I'd go to these, these four sections. We are now at number four. Um, so I'm going to very quickly just go through a few um, uh, tips. Here's, here's the, the, the kind of five things I want to focus on. I'll just, I'll leave them there for a second, let everyone absorb. So that so it's these these five uh, elements. I'm just going to qu quickly go um, through now, kind of explain explain what I mean, explain why we think they're important. Um, so the first is about uh, if, uh, is not about the data. So uh, in nine cases out of ten, probably ninety nine cases out of hundred, um, the, the, these projects they don't start uh, with a focus around the data, um, and nor should they. So I'd say the focus here that is in much much more helpful uh, that I hope a lot of people on this call probably already already familiar with so I'll just touch on it quickly is, is going from a problem focus and that might be um, uh, something quite uh, kind of intuitive um, that's already happening with an organization you know you go from a kind of a, a point of view of the organizational challenges and you work your way out um, but for, for some of this uh, the fact we're talking about data can itself kind of muddy the water a bit because suddenly you're, you're talking instead of, of organizational challenges as a whole you're talking about this separate thing this like profession that might sit within your organization um, and, a, and a, a not the technique is not always tied in to those grand challenges and the bigger picture facing the organization so I'd say make to do a bit of a check and make sure that those things are tied together if you do need any support doing that uh, I think these three uh, resources that I've got up here are, are wonderful. So uh, Eddie Copeland, um, uh, now at Lottie, uh, did a, a great little full-step approach to collaborative data projects. That's the thing at the top right. Uh, and then two organizations that do this well. So NPCs Inspiring Impact uh, web resources uh, are wonderful to, to kind of go from a, a perspective of uh, essentially kind of theory of change and, and uh, impact and understanding your impact. Uh, rather than from kind of what can my data tell me uh, and then lastly coalition for efficiency offer pro bono support um, to, to do exactly this um, our, our second point uh, is around data maturity so this is the phrase we use um, to describe where an organization's at in its data journey uh, it's a framework we created a, a few years ago now um, in partnership with an organization called data orchard who are a consultancy um, they uh, helped uh, to interview a lot of a lot of chat i can't remember how many now quite, quite a few uh, social change organizations to ask them about um their, their kind of data landscape within the organization and we put those findings together into these seven components of organizational data maturity um, so the reason why, why i find this is helpful is because often um your an organization isn't equally as advanced in one area as the other and it might be that actually you're great at analysis and your skills are really, really strong as an organization, but leadership just isn't interested. Uh, so for us, it's useful because we know how best to frame our interventions to get change to happen in those organizations, but also very useful within those organizations where you've got people, you know, separate teams trying to make change. They can kind of understand what, where, where are the doors that need to be kind of pushed on the hardest. Our next section here is around responsible data use. Um, so the 
the big takeaway here from my perspective is that this is not a bolt-on. Um, so to start with responsible data use considerations. Uh, we we see that a lot of uh, organisations will kind of get to the end perhaps of projects and then say, okay, and we need to tick the ethics boxes. But that's I'd say that's that's not the the um, example we want to copy. I'd say instead. Um, Use uh, kind of use frameworks to help guide your, your thoughts to, at the start of the project to, to handle questions like what assumptions are being made, where's the data come from, can it bear weight, uh, which are the the questions that sense about science that graphic on that on the left hand side um, suggest uh, in their data science a guide for society. I think that's a wonderful little framework. Just to, three questions to get thinking started. That you don't need super technical expertise. You just need to to kind of handle the realities of those questions. You know, are we are we making um, are we, are we le uh, making big decisions based on shaky data, for example? Uh, dot everyone's consequence scanning also great for this. And of course, I would be totally amiss if on my uh, ODI lunchtime lecture I did not mention the ethics canvas. The ODI's data ethics canvas is excellent. Uh, I wouldn't mention it even if I, uh, the, they weren't the uh, the hosts of this wonderful event. Um, uh, and all, all of those resources can be be found by uh, a quick Google search online. So um, penultimate point is, is start where you are. Um, and this, I think this is, this is so important. This is the one I'd probably want to labor the most because a, a lot of organizations um, uh, look at where they are and say, it's not good enough. We need a new data strategy. We need uh, to pay X hundred thousand pounds on a new system uh, that puts all our data together and we can, uh, and that we can use for analysis. But in a lot of cases, that's not, I don't think that the most helpful uh, way forward. So I'd suggest instead kind of, yes, everyone's on a journey, understand where you are on that journey and find the things that helps you and your organization where you are. Um, that might be, you know, some of the images I've got here, you know, Google Sheets. I, I, I know of organizations who have built beautiful technical systems 100% off Google Sheets. It is possible. I'm not saying I advocate that necessarily. You have to find what fits for you, but it's, it's possible to do wonderful things with basic technologies. Um, things like batch geo you can make wonderful maps and it's drag and drop and uh, if you do want to get a bit more involved uh, python and r are both open source that translates as free uh, coding platforms and and they're where where you can start if you do want to bring a bit more technical expertise into the the organization um, there is loads of support to get this done so the data literacy project and data wise london um a two i've put up here but there are so many um don't um uh, yeah don't think you're alone and also don't think you have to pay loads of money to get this kind of support if you do want it um and my i guess my final point that i want to bundle into this one is start not only where you are as an organization but potentially with the people you have as well and uh, so it's, it's wonderful when organizations invest in and hire data people and grow data teams um but you don't necessarily need to start with new recruits it might be that you've got individuals in your organization who are really interested in doing this kind of thing and uh, and maybe want to go away and learn Python and R, for example, um, or uh, uh, kind of get, yeah, get get more involved in, in kind of techniques within their existing tools like Google Sheets or Excel, or whatever. Um, so I, I'd recommend um, sticking with that that interest and seeing if you can uh, develop those skills uh, of the people you have uh, within your organization already. If, if you are doing that, turn to support network. So our social data society I've mentioned already, that's great for um, making sure that if people are alone in, in their armies of one within an organization, then at least they're not alone within the wider sector and that they do get those support networks. Um, and my last tip here, uh, five and five, make the case. Uh, this, so here, my, my, uh, Kind of, I suppose, uh, my last point because this is is uh, where I'll stop, um, and one that I think is incredibly um, important in our experience with the organisations we work with, is that you may be in a position where you need to break a cycle of no investment in data use and data science. And you might go, oh, we can't possibly do this stuff because it costs money. And we don't have the money to do it, but we can't get the money to do it because my boss doesn't think that it's worth it investing in because they don't understand the power of data use and data science and you I see it speaks to a lot of people who are kind of stuck in the cycle so I'd say tr try and break that cycle by making the case for data use um, one way you can do that is you start with one thing so in the examples I've given I've tried to use that all around like the one thing um, that the organization have taken back that has been really useful that has not been the only thing that's come out of these projects but that the, the fact that there is one thing that was really eye-opening 
in itself shows that you can be quite focused um, in your attempts to use data science and still change a lot of minds. So don't worry if you're, you're thinking, oh, we have, to, we have to prove everything. No, actually, maybe just start with the one thing and seeing if that, that's eye-opening for the, the staff around you or whoever it is you need to persuade. Um, don't worry about the tech, so start where you are, um, build things one off and then uh, worry about systems when you've got buy-in uh, to build those systems. Um, and lastly, get, get free support if you can. So that's what all the, the slides, the pictures on this slide are for. Uh, so of course there, there's us, but there's loads of other organizations offering uh, pro bono or low bono support. And, and the reason all these organizations exist is because we want to help jumpstart that and break that cycle, help you make the case for, for using some of this stuff. So, so you don't need us forever. Uh, so you just need us at the start and then, and then organizations can kind of move into a, uh, um, a new a new normal uh, with some of these skills and concepts so I'm going to stop there uh, I hope now I've left enough time for questions and that we'll have some great dialogue uh, you have indeed thank you very much for a really enjoyable presentation at this point we'd normally clap if we were all sitting in the room together um, you can clap with a reactions button so there you go I've done a little clap for you um, We'll go through the questions one by one. I see there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I'll start from the top because I feel like that makes sense. Uh, so Hannah, would you like to unmute and just ask your question? Yeah, hi, uh, Giselle, I'm uh, Hannah, work at the ODI. Um, my question was, what are the biggest skill gaps that exist in the social sector in your opinion? in terms of uh, working with data to make decisions. So maybe even broader than data science, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I was on mute, so the, uh, the phrase of our, our current era. Um, yes, yeah, so in terms of um, skills gaps that exist, I think there are, I mean, that there are a lot and it's not, it's not just our sector, um, I think, uh, you know, this, this data science stuff in its current permutation is is quite new. So that means that that kind of skills are trying to catch up. Um, it's also underpins one of the big challenges about getting data science into the charity sector because data scientists are expensive because uh, the the kind of supply hasn't quite yet caught up to demand. Um, so that's another. Uh, and that we'll see that change a bit um, over the next five ten years, I think. So um, I would split the skills gaps into two. I'd say firstly we have um, a lack of uh, data uh, data confident senior leadership, and and that's not um, that's not to say we need senior leadership who can do any of this stuff and who necessarily have strong kind of technical careers sitting behind them. Um, but what we do know is do need is in individuals who have been in some form exposed to this stuff um, are confident enough in its potential to start having those conversations and to give um, space and um, uh, kind of permission to their teams to to do this and embed it in organizations so uh, there's and and there is there's, there's things like uh, you kind of young trustees programs that are trying to get um, uh, different demographics into the uh, things like trusteeship of charities and I'd say something similar for data science would be wonderful um, but it's so it's it's and, and I know and it's not just trustees it's kind of senior management as well so SCVO for example the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations have a wonderful senior leadership program that includes modules on, on kind of getting used to data and getting confidence in data so it's those kind of interventions I think are really helpful there and the, the second skills gap is uh, individuals who are um, uh, able to uh, be a jack of all trades within the, the kind of data science umbrella and uh, and are confident enough to operate in very small teams, potentially just on their own in organizations. And you'd, and the reason why this is, um, is a bit of a gap is I think that the normal uh, route in, in data science is that you do, you, you start within, say for example, in the private sector working in teams. So actually by the time you've got to a point where you don't, you're not reliant on that team structure anymore and you can do a lot of things and you're confident enough doing those things on your own, you're actually, you're, you're kind of mid career and it, the charity sector can no longer afford you so it's it's more it's i wouldn't call it a gap it's more a kind of a mismatch between the kind of things that are needed in the charity sector and the kind of um, individuals that might be kind of available and best suited to those roles great i think that was a really good answer um secondly we've got a, a sort of statement i think this is rather than a question from brendan d uh brendan i don't know whether you want to uh turn that into a question or or maybe just repeat the statement 
Okay, I'm going to uh, take that as a, a no, but the statement is for those who maybe can't see it is I'd suggest understanding uh, of the value and role of data to inform strategy, decisions and performance. Too often data is a necessary evil, something that has to be gathered to satisfy funders and regulators rather than a source of enlightenment. Um, we've also got a question from, from John. Uh, John, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I'm just being a little bit pedantic, I think, and thanks for all of that. Uh, I just, I must have missed something at the beginning of that graph, that there were three options, that something could be excellent, or it could meet expectations, or it could exceed expectations. It felt like a slightly totalitarian graph. Where does data go if the outcome doesn't meet expectations? Hi, yeah, thank you. So um, essentially, it's the it's the uh, Clemmy, I think that's the chart you're you're thinking of, and it's their terminology for like not what we want, but fine, um, great, and really great. Um, and they wouldn't because of the the way they operate and um, the uh, message they want to send to their service users, they wouldn't say someone like basically failed and was terrible um, because they don't. That's that's not the message they want to send to people who have essentially been told all their life they keep failing. Um, so I'd I'd say it's it's probably a linguistic more than anything else, and interpret that as not particularly good, good and great. Cool. Then we we have a question that I put in. I sort of jumped the gun a little bit, and you answered it with your last uh, statement. Um, so I'm going to slightly change it uh, and ask you: In your experience, how long does it take to actually get that buy-in from leadership once you start to make the case? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it, a while um, would be my my normal answer. Potentially, we'll see things uh, change. Probably a, a silver lining to the current horrendous situation we're seeing um, with COVID is that organisations are having their hand forced in terms of digital delivery and data being an offshoot of, of kind of digital delivery. I think we we might say see organisations. Um, uh, essentially being forced to kind of embrace this quicker than they otherwise would. But uh, uh, if I can I'll frame the rest of my answer in terms of a business as usual and the experience we've seen over the past um, uh, time data plans existed uh, rather than the last few months. Um, and, um, and, I'd, and I'd say kind of the, the, there's no one time period for this journey for organizations, but where we do see change, it's not unusual for that to be over the course of years. So when we do a, a three to six month program, uh, we'll kind of catch up with an organization a couple of months after they've done that program and see what's changed. Uh, and and usually usually things have, but actually it's the the year later when we're talking to them again, where they've said, okay, now we finally, we hired that person or we redesigned that program or our teams, uh, we've our data team works differently now. So it's across all parts of the organization and uh, it's part of our senior management team's monthly reporting, whatever it might be. Um, uh, and sometimes actually it's it's even you know it's it's even longer than that and organizations might come back to us for a second project a couple of years after their first project and not much has changed but enough has changed to show that they're that they're trying to make it happen they want to make it happen and the second intervention might be helpful brilliant thank you and i think we've got one final question from 444 uh 444 if you want to ask your question hello yeah, my question. Can you hear me? Yeah, my question was about uh, you talked about uh, making a case and approaching these uh, organizations. And how about uh, maybe you have this idea and uh, it's actually maybe something that you want to offer as a service. How do you get your first client, especially when you don't have a team and uh, it needs so much to put together? Yeah, it's a thank you. Good question. Um, and a question actually we get fairly frequently because we um, we have a lot of kind of expressions of interest coming from data, small data for good groups um, that are 100% volunteer run that pop up in different, uh, particularly different cities in Europe, um, who kind of want to know how do we how do we do this stuff? How do we roll on? Um, and the general pattern is that there's a um, what I'd probably call an oversupply or a very generous supply, if not that, um, of tech talent. So there are a lot of data scientists and data experts who want to do these kind of projects, but there's normally an undersupply of charities who um, are able to engage. Um, and, and I think that the reason for that is that you rarely see a ready-made project, uh, a re sorry, ready-made data science project um, in the social sector. Normally first encounters are more like um, 
informal conversations you know how okay how's the organization doing what what you know what's frustrating you what are the challenges what do you think might be the most useful thing going forward and from there we might turn it over even many months um into uh, even longer than that, actually sometimes um into a technical scope that's um kind of tight enough for a data science project to start so um i'd say the the yeah the, the important thing of, of making these these final projects happen is is not to assume that the projects walk through the door but actually when people walk through the door to, like have enough conversations with them over time um to to turn ideas into into technical projects um don't rush them people normally have to kind of go back talk to talk to colleagues uh, find a time that's right for them particularly because our focus is on capacity building we we it's imperative for us the organization's in a good headspace and can work with us in a way to maximize what they gain and learn from the process um so we'd always um basically sit back and, and make sure that they're, they're kind of driving in terms of when's right and who's right to engage um in your your very specific question on, on the text was how did you get your first client i can't answer that because i wasn't there um the many years ago we got our first client um i uh I can imagine it had some relation to the fact that our founder did a TED talk. <laughs> that probably helped. Um, promotion always does. Uh, but I, I, I mean, I'd, I'd imagine, you know, in, in that circumstance, it's really a case of kind of putting yourself out there and waiting for, for organisations to come to you. Brilliant. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions. So uh, I'd like to just say one final thank you to you, Giselle, for a really engaging presentation. Uh, thank you to all the participants who've joined us today. Um, we'll be taking a break from lunchtime lectures over the Easter holidays, uh, but we'll be back on the 17th of April uh, and we'll hear from Bill Roberts from Swell about why citizens, businesses and government are not using or taking full advantage of government data, which should be a really interesting one. Um, in the meantime, uh, I think that's it for today. So please take care, uh, stay safe, everyone, um, and have a good rest of the week.